Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Human Resolve Podcast. I'm here with my special guest, Dr. Cindy Sai. Cindy, please tell my audience more about you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So I am a board certified physician, a best-selling author, a wellness expert, a speaker, and a life coach. And I love helping high achievers decrease stress and avoid burnout so that they can live their best lives with ease. Mm. So Cindy, you and I connected because you were so kind and so generous in um, contributing to my interview series with Authority Magazine, Rising Through Resilience, How to Be Resilient During Turbulent Times. And one of the things I really loved was this right off the gate about gratitude. Our brain has that negativity bias. Could you just give us more context into uh, how gratitude has showed up in your own life? Yes. So I think a lot of times we talk about having gratitude, being grateful. And I think it's really easy to be grateful when things are working. <laughs> and it's another thing when things aren't working for you to still be in that state of gratitude. And that's really a key that I've seen, a skill that I've developed over time that I've really seen made a, make a big difference in my life. When I'm able to be open and present and appreciative of whatever is going on, it has really allowed and opened up for so much more possibility in my life. And I did mention the part about our brains having this negativity bias, and it's because we're wired for survival. And so when things aren't working, we're going to keep looking for problems. Whereas when we're in a state of gratitude and focusing on opportunity and solution, that actually takes you out of that problem mindset and opens you up to all the things that are working and shifts you into this other space so that you can move forward and progress. Yeah. So I would love to just go back a little bit. Uh, I loved how you mentioned that you were a shy introvert with a good girl syndrome. Tell me the Cindy from way back when and how she's come so far. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the youngest of four daughters. There's a big age gap between me and my sisters and like more than 10 years. And so growing up, I was always just doing the right things, you know, wanting to please everybody, make everyone happy, be the peacemaker. And so what that looked like was really being this perfectionist and like being super organized. Like would, I would organize my stuffed animals from small to big and like, you know, make sure my room was clean and all these things. And I was always very health conscious and I loved learning and science. And my dad was a surgeon. And so I was exposed to medicine from a young age. And so I thought that being a doctor made a lot of sense and I worked really hard and just you know, kept going and, and, you know, was so focused on being a doctor. And um, I think that a lot of the things that in terms of being shy, introverted, it, um, I think, makes sense when you're in the medical field where you kind of, it's a very structured path. Mm -hmm. And um, I think as I progressed, I, my own journey, there were certain things that came up, health, related, whatever, um, personal life, that really gave me the opportunity to reflect and think about who am I really and what is really important to me and, and how do I really want to show up in the world? Yeah. You know, you moved from doctor and then you said you were thinking about therapy, but then you still were stuck. And then you found the holy grail, which is uh, coaching or life coaching. How did that um, migration to that, what was that like? Yeah, so I think I had always been interested and loved self-help and self-development. I was always reading books and taking courses and things like that and found therapy very helpful and continue to go to therapy regularly for support. And I think what I realized was I wanted to really make more progress and actually take action and like change things um, for good. And, and I think that for me, coaching really, really helped me with that because I was able to look at 
my whole mindset perspective and look at and also learn so many tools and skills so that it became my own. And I think that's really key when you're um, learning and, and, you know, growing. It's there's a difference between understanding and knowing and doing right and actually seeing it and being it and, and having it in your life. And for me, coaching was definitely one of those really, really useful practices that have allowed me to shift and see so much positive change that I was inspired to become a coach myself. I was like, other people need to know about this. <laughs> so it really started my whole journey um, into the coaching space. Yeah. I loved in the piece when you mentioned my worth as a human comes from not being a physician in a white coat, but how I felt about myself. I mean, it's so beautiful because you realize the essence of what some people don't realize even when they get really old is that you have to be comfortable within your skin and what you have achieved and or done in this life. So just love that. I mean, I'm sure that was not easy. Definitely. I think it was a process and an ongoing journey, right? I really think we're all here with our own lessons to learn and experiences to have. And I think so often we're conditioned to look external for approval, right? And we keep going after like that achievement and success, that award and recognition and all these things. And it's this ongoing treadmill that never ends. And Thankfully, I think through coaching and through really practicing mindfulness and learning to be present and really knowing that we really only have right now. And, you know, when you're constantly worried about the past or the future or what you don't have or, you know, all these things, you're never going to be, you're never going to be at peace. And that's a really hard place to be, right? I mean, there's a lot of stressful things already. <laughs> To be able to, I think, really have that sense of grounding and inner peace, I think is a really powerful place to be. Yeah. I also think, speaking from someone who's also an immigrant and grew up in an Asian household, uh, and you probably had even more pressures. Your dad was a physician, you're Ivy League graduate, you were a physician yourself. Um, I'm sure it wasn't easy, um, you know, that whole process you know, for you. Yeah, I would say that it's definitely been a transition and um, but a very, very exciting and fulfilling one. And I think a big part of it is really being open to the possibility of how things could be and not being attached to a certain way. And I think that's definitely very different from all of my training <laughs> and the past experiences going through medical school, residency, practicing as a physician, right? There's a lot of structure and it's very linear versus as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you really get to make a lot of different decisions and, and see different things come up that you never even thought possible. And I'm grateful to have wonderful support and people and connecting with people like you and, and, you know, really knowing that, um, we're all here to, to do really important things and, and so good to be in community. In the article, you mentioned how, when you were a medical student, you were just afraid to make any mistake, uh, and how you saw coaching as a way to just sort of allow people to just optimize their health and well being. Like it's not about right or wrong. It's just about improving and, or looking at insights. I would love for you to just give us some insights and in how one is able to do that. Well, I think it's, it definitely is a process and I think it really comes down to really, I talk a lot about mindfulness and being in the present, paying attention without judgment. And I really think that piece of non-judgment is so key because a lot of times we're really tied to right or wrong, yes or no. Like it's very um, extreme, right? Or, or it's almost like it's it's either or, just very duality thinking. And I think that it can be very limiting when you only give yourself those two options. 
And so I think for me, definitely having been a perfectionist for much of my life, what I realized was a lot of times it's very much grounded in fear because whether it's fear of failure, fear of making a mistake, fear of judgment, all of these things. And when you're able to look at it and actually be open and curious about it and really taking that sense of compassion, which I share and talk about in the article too, of how important it is to really learn how to be your own best friend and, and really support and guide yourself through all these ups and downs in life. Yeah. And it was so beautiful because you also mentioned your parents gave you that support that you needed during that process. Yes. I'm, I'm very grateful and fortunate to have my parents um, on board with this transition and all the things that I've been doing because I know that especially um, being traditional and, and growing up in this Chinese household, they definitely had certain expectations and, and wanted, you know, was expecting my life to be a certain way. And I think part of it is just when when they see how I am now versus how I was before, they talk about how much happier I am and all these other great things that have come since. And I, and I think as parents, that's really what you want, right? You really just, it just comes down to wanting your kids to be happy yeah. and knowing that we all have a finite amount of time here and how can we really make the most of it and, and stay really be in connection with each other. So Cindy, I want to come back to the focus of today's conversation. How do you define resilience? Yeah, so I think resilience is really this ability to face and bounce back from adversity or setbacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I asked a curious question as well about uh, courage and resilience. Some people see it as one and the same. Some of them see it as different. How do you view both? words? Yes, I really like that question because it, it prompted me to, to pause and think about it. And I do think they're closely related and both are important in helping us really manage adversity, failures, and kind of the things that come up in life. And I think what I mentioned in the article was courage talks about the strength you need to face anything that comes your way while resilience is that skill that you would use to really pick yourself up when things aren't going your way. And so I think what I talked about in the article about just if you're stranded in a storm without reception, courage is like that healthy snack to keep you going <laughs> while resilience is like the map to actually help guide your way. So I think you know, you can have one or the other, like when you just have courage, you might have use up a lot of excess energy, but then you don't have the skill or direction of resilience, right? So you're not as efficient. When you only have resilience, um, you may not get through it as quickly without the strength of courage. So I think having both will really help you recover and grow faster. So they're very much closely related. Now, I asked a question uh, in the piece about uh, when you think of resilience, what comes to mind? And you mentioned Malala. Can you please tell me what, what is it about her life that uh, you find most compelling? Yeah, I think it's so inspiring to see young women really stand up for themselves. And especially in her circumstances, right, being facing the Taliban and just near death attack, like all of these things and, and just her commitment to fighting for the right to education and equality. And these are, you know, I think a lot of times these things we take for granted in our Western society and culture. And it's always really helpful to see these other stories and really puts things in perspective of, hey, what do we really have here, right? And, and 
tying it back to in the beginning when we started with gratitude, right? I think so often we just are, we take so many things for granted until maybe it doesn't work out or whatever. <laughs> so I think it's, it's really, really powerful to hear and see stories like that. A question I asked was, uh, did someone ever tell you something was impossible? And you mentioned it was your entrepreneurial journey. Take us back. What was that like? Yeah. So for me, I had spent basically my whole life focused on becoming a physician. And I worked really hard going to all the top schools, Hopkins, Dartmouth, all the things, checked all the boxes. <laughs> and um, and and so I, I think that was really my, my life path. And when I made the decision to transition into entrepreneurship, there's so much uncertainty and unknown because it was definitely all new to me, not having background in business, marketing, sales, any of those things. And I think, you know, everyone had something to say. Right? <laughs> it's like, you have to do this first. No, you have to do that. No, this doesn't like, you know, and, and I appreciate that people were coming from a good place based on their experiences and all the things. But it was also, I think, can also be overwhelming and really stressful because it's like, well, then what do I do? <laughs> and so, um, so I think the, the biggest lesson was really to just keep going and to take action, <laughs> knowing that and really reframing the idea of failure and mistakes because you know, that's how you learn. And knowing that, like, I, one thing I like to say is you either get the results you wanted or the lessons you needed. Mm -hmm. And that has really served me well, because, you know, if I have a launch or if I have something and it's like, it doesn't go well, you know, I'm not going to be sitting in like, you know, just in a negative spiral, which doesn't get you anywhere. Right. It's like, well, okay, what happened? Let's detach. Let's look at this objectively, right? What's the lesson here? How can I improve? And I think that mentality, um, that persistence and grit probably definitely was, you know, part of my medical journey. <laughs> so I think that's still <laughs> translated over um, very well. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think, you know, it's, everyone has their own perspective and you know, some people want to tell you this way is the only way and that way. And I just, I always just say, you know, you're here on your journey. This is what I did. It may or may not help you. You're going to do it your way. And it's going to be so beautiful. <laughs> As you know, being a coach yourself, visions, the idea of creating a vision is huge in, in the coaching world. And this idea, I love the fact that you were like, well, I have an idea of what I want to do. So let me just reverse engineer it and figure it out as I go along. And I, I think that's very important to have that vision or at least that idea in mind. Otherwise you're just going through it blindly and then frustration sets in. Yeah, I think it's really important to check in with yourself as you continue to evolve as things come up and giving yourself permission for things to change. Right, because you may have this vision of wanting X, Y, Z, and then something comes up and you're like, oh wait, I really don't like teaching courses or I really don't like doing podcasts, like whatever, right? <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well then maybe podcasts isn't your thing, that's cool. Um, so I do think it's, it's important to have the vision, to take action, to try it out, and also really staying connected to who you are being intentional about it and, and just exploring and having fun along the way. Yeah. Well, that transitions into uh, the question about setbacks. Well, getting diagnosed with any illness can be very stressful. And I think as a physician, it was very, um, very humbling to, to be a patient myself early on in my career, which I'm grateful for. And I think that autoimmune specifically, we talk about essentially the body attacking your own cells. And as I worked with different healers and coaches, there's also um, 
just the idea of rejecting yourself, right? And I think that symbolism was really stark for me because there was part of me that was going through the motions and doing all the right things, but still not fully feeling fulfilled or really, I think, living in my truth of really wanting to help people in, in my way, right? Instead of maybe seeing 20 patients a day or prescribing medications or something like that, that just, um, so I thought it was really, really great opportunity to reflect and to really think about my own values and priorities. And I think so often I see this with patients where they, um, you know, they they also have this mentality of like, you know, I can do it, keep going, keep going. And then um, they might have various physical ailments or symptoms and things come up and, and then they don't really pay attention to it. And unfortunately, a lot of times it gets louder and worse. And, you know, people get diagnosed with very serious things like cancer and, and all these things. And then they're really forced to stop and slow down and think about things, right? And so I really think our bodies hold so much wisdom. And um, when we can learn how to really work together, have that mind-body connection and, and really be well in, in mind and body, I think that's when that's a really really great place to be yeah i also love it in the piece where you mentioned how to cultivate resilience and you really brought a whole new light to this idea of hard work and i loved 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 how you mentioned it takes two things the willingness to put in the effort and also the skills to direct that energy appropriately beautiful like you need to tell me more information about that that's great <laughs> Yeah, well, I think a lot of times, you know, we just think it takes, you know, just like muscle through, right? And and I see this so much, especially with clients, because, you know, people who are in or nearing burnout, right? And, and that's exactly what it is. It's, you know, we all have a finite amount of energy. It's like, think about your cell phone. Every morning, it's full. And at the end of the day, it's empty. Right. So it's the same. Like we also only have a finite amount of energy every day. And I think, you know, we we need to be very strategic about how we're utilizing this energy and also being honest about it. Right. Like what are your strengths? What's going to nourish you? Right. Because just because you can do it doesn't mean you have to do everything. <laughs> and And so I think it's really being open to that, like, hey, yes, you're willing, you're committed, but also how do you do it and where do you direct your energy most effectively so that you're not working like 24 seven, right? Because what fun is that? <laughs> <laughs> so Cindy, what are your five steps someone can take to become more resilient? Yeah, so I talk about resilience being this skill that can be developed and strengthened. And I really like to encourage people to see it that way because especially with all the information we have about growth mindset and all these things, right? Like just because you were born in a certain family, have certain circumstances, like it's okay right? Like you can change the moment you decide to change and put focus mm -hmm. on this. And so the five steps that I talk about for becoming more resilient, I actually have a mnemonic. It's called, it's um, P-A-S-G-A. And so it's punk artists sing great anthems. <laughs> so um, step one, P stands for pause. And that's basically stop and notice what is. And it's because we can't change what we don't know. And we really need to learn to be present and aware without judgment. So an easy way to do that is just take a breath, right? An intentional breath. Step two, A is for ask. And that means just being curious and asking yourself why this is happening. 
So how is whatever is going on happening for you and not to you? And I, a question I like to ask people is, why is this a problem? Because I think a lot of times, you know, it might not be a problem. It, it could be a solution, right? An opportunity. So um, that's number two. Number three is self-compassion. And I think self-compassion is just such a powerful skill because when you learn how to be kind to yourself, no matter what, you can get through so many crazy things, right? So really learning to offer words of kindness to yourself. And step four, G is for gratitude, where I talked about the brain having this negativity bias because it's wired to look for danger and keep us safe. But when we're in a state of gratitude, it gets us out of that negativity spiral so that we can really shift and pivot and focus on the positive and everything that is working. And a simple thing is just to ask yourself, what are three things I'm grateful for right now? And it could be simple things. I mean, running water, right? Like having just whatever, like I think a lot of things we take for granted. And then the last step is action, which is taking responsibility and just deciding what to do next and then doing it. <laughs> and I think a lot of times, you know, we get stuck um, thinking about the steps and, and wanting it to look a certain way. And then we forget that we actually have to take action for it to actually come true. So um, basically, the five steps are pause, ask, self-compassion, gratitude, and action. And I devised this process because I really wanted to give people a framework to be able to practice and implement and know that it can be simple and you just need to, you know, every little bit counts and just every, even, even the smallest things I would say it might be easier to start with those, right? Because a lot of times when something really stressful or intense happens, we can get so um, attached and just like sucked into it that it's very hard to have that other perspective. So if anything, it could be starting with the little things when something doesn't work out. Try this out, knowing that you know resilience is a skill and you can absolutely really build it and become more resilient in your everyday. So Cindy, I would love to transition now into what I call brainstorming. I asked a question in the article, uh, if you could create a movement, what would that be? And yours was really beautiful. It was about compassion and having a state of non-judgment. I was thinking maybe you and I can just talk a little bit about how maybe that idea can be fostered a little deeper in our lives and in the lives of that, those people that we care about. Yeah, absolutely. I think compassion is one of those things that's that's easier said than done. <laughs> and I really think that fundamentally we're all humans. We all want to be seen, heard, and understood. And I think that really we're we're all trying our best in every moment based on kind of that point in time. And I think sometimes we just get stuck, we forget, right? Like the bigger picture and, and um, our whys. And so I think compassion is really just a way for us to really stay connected and to really offer that, that love and kindness. And, you know, I think the world would be a better place is if everyone <laughs> would be able to offer that, um, you know, the charitable assumptions to each other and, and all of that. So, yeah. 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 What comes to mind in this area is like, what is it that you and I have in common? Even if it's one thing I think can further the conversation rather than thinking of all the 20 things that we are different or opposed. When that was mentioned in your article and I was thinking about it, I was like, that's really where the conversation should take place. It, we might disagree on a whole bunch of things, but what do we agree on? Or do we agree on at least an iota of something? <laughs> and I, I think that's a start perhaps in the right direction. Yeah, I think a lot of times we 
focus on differences. And it's almost like you have your own set of beliefs, right? That you're very, um, that, that are kind of yours based on whatever experiences and, and whatever. And that's very much a part of you. And when you see somebody else who doesn't have something similar, you're like, oh, no, they're totally different. They're not cool, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's, it's a shame because, you know, you're missing out on all the potential connection that you could have, right? And also all of the, the, the learnings and things that, that you could gain from each other. Um, I was doing a talk for a group a um, couple of weeks ago, and I asked them to talk to, um, after the talk, to meet a new person and to find three things in common <laughs> with them. And it was a really great exercise because people really took the time to listen to be open and curious and they found a lot of different things in that they actually had in common that they wouldn't have found otherwise and i really think that you know there's so much power in in knowing that there is connection and that we're all human <laughs> and and being there for each other yeah 100 percent. well cindy this was beautiful so please tell my viewers and listeners uh, where they can find out more about you and your work Thank you. Yes. So feel free to visit my website at cindysimd.com. And I released a best-selling book called So Much Better. So that's available on Amazon and where books are sold. It's a self-help book based in mindfulness. And I share life-changing strategies to help you develop calm, confidence, and curiosity to become your own inspiring success story. Wonderful. Cindy, this was beautiful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Savio. So good to be here. Sure.